Welcome to the Rideshare Guy podcast, where you will learn about the rideshare and mobility industry straight from Harry Campbell, who's got over five years experience covering the industry and has talked to thousands of drivers. There's no better place to stay up to date, entertained, and educated. So let's dive in. Dustin Walsey worked for many years at Akamai Technologies, where he held various roles in business development. And for more than a decade, he was the owner and president of Autotown Insurance, one of the largest insurance agencies in the Southeast. In 2017, he launched Buckle with the goal of helping gig economy workers access affordable financial services they need to be financially secure, helping them to achieve economic freedom. He's also got a bachelor's degree in finance and marketing from Indiana University, Bloomington, and he passionately supports and serves the youth sports in Atlanta, Georgia community. So Dustin, how are you doing today? Very well. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm excited to chat and uh, actually meet you, you know, face to face, at least virtually. And I should maybe amend your bio too, because I think we talked uh, a couple times, right? When you were working uh, for our president of Autotown Insurance, is that right? Yeah. I mean, the, the idea of Buckle came originally from Autotown Insurance. So uh, mm. with you being a thought leader and an information source for which started as rideshare and now, you know, the greater gig economy, very familiar with um, the information that you put out and uh, as a, an incredible resource. So yes, we've talked before uh, from time to time. <laughs> Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And it is actually kind of funny. You're the second guest uh, I've had on recently. Actually, uh, our, our friends over at Argyle, one of their co-founders, uh, Billy Marsden, he used to work at a consulting firm and he reached out to me for some consulting work several years ago. I mean, more than several, maybe four or five years ago, and then did some other stuff and then went and launched this company, Argyle, that's very relevant to what you and I both do. And so it's sort of funny to see that uh, come full circle. But um, tell me, how did you, you know, kind of make that transition from Autotown Insurance? I pulled up the web website right here for Autotown. Um, and I mean, this seems more like a traditional insurance carrier. And now you're obviously still in the insurance business, but, you know, kind of running what I think of as more of a startup. How did that transition even come about or how'd you start thinking about it? Autotown Insurance, where I began my career in the insurance industry, is traditionally a, a broker fo brokerage focused on wheels in Atlanta, Georgia. Got and it. in you know, roughly 2010, 11, I started insuring a multitude of you know, commercial lines, but a mm -hmm. very heavy focus on taxi and limousine. And what started to happen in the late 2010s, all of a sudden, Uber shows up on the scene. And I'm like, what a great opportunity. And to refresh your memory, as you know, Uber started in the black car business. Yeah. So I physically would just hail an Uber, mm. hop in the back of one of the vehicles, and I would sell a commercial auto insurance policy to these drivers. Mm. Next thing you know, I wake up and I am insuring the vast majority of all the limousines or black cars in Atlanta and the greater state of Georgia. Mm. Well, one day UberX shows up on the scene and it's people using their personal auto to drive yeah. people around. And being in the insurance business, that became a challenge because when people use personal auto in a commercial yeah. fashion, it creates a, a, a lot of problems. And yeah. that became the idea of Buckle because when I don't have a product and I have a very sales distribution mm -hmm. background that really fit because when people were like, hey, I need to use my yeah. personal auto to, to drive for Uber, I couldn't write them. And that became the idea uh, for, for Buckle. I've known my partner, Marty Young, for years, reached out to him. He was doing a bunch of work on the claim side. And uh, that uh, late uh, in early 2017, we launched Buckle and it's been a, a mm. great story. So it, it really came from me riding in the back of yeah. my cars. Hmm. Very cool. Well, you know, the reason why I want to have you on was obviously to discuss Buckle, but I think before we dive into the details of Buckle, I have to stop you right there and just, I say, I guess in one way, commend you, but also just uh, ask you about, you know, your, your travels in the back of those Ubers. Cause you know, I actually think that that's a great acquisition strategy for certain products and services. I mean, especially insurance, you know, that's going to be higher dollar value amounts, you know, maybe not for a free download of an app. You might not want to go into the back of a bunch of Uber cars and try and convince the driver but um, you know, even then, I, mean, I guess what, what uh, kind of motivated you to like actually take that step and go physically and do that in the back of cars of drivers? Because I, I suggest that to a lot of people, you know, to get out and kind of you know put yourself out there, ride in the backs of Ubers. But I feel like a lot of people in today's day and age, just from a sales perspective, want to keep things digital. They want to go on Facebook groups or they want to email people or call people. Uh, what, what were your, what was your uh, uh, thoughts there? Well, first of all, and this is a little side story, but pretty funny. My wife absolutely 
hates it when we go out to dinner because I am always talking and we have kids and to get out's great, but I am always talking to drivers and, it, you know, not paying as much attention to her in the back. Of the uh, yeah. My wife so feels the same. <laughs> she, she, could, she could sell buckle as, uh, as good as anybody and, for, and the same for my children. Uh, so when I'm in the back of lifts and Ubers to this day, I do talk to them. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's an incredible strategy, but I, I think it's incredible for a variety of reasons is you really get to understand the people uh, mm -hmm. that are supporting the world that we live in. And, you know, as, you know, even COVID to this day, uh, as, you know, rideshare drivers shifted into food delivery and package delivery and even, you know, grocery delivery, these are the people that are the front lines yeah. of, against our war on COVID. So the appreciation that I gained, not just in selling an insurance policy, was was just to really understand that these people are hardworking mm -hmm. um people that are trying to get ahead and yeah. what is so important to me at buckle and i think it's it's woven into our culture is if we can help these people just a little by having you know affordable insurance uh protecting mm -hmm. their cars which tend to be their most important asset that they own so that if they get into an accident no matter what they're covered it is yeah. a, a great situation so by learning from these drivers Mm -hmm. understanding what their concerns are. Yeah. Uh, we were able to build a company off of it. And to this day, uh, we use brand ambassadors when we launch into a new city mm -hmm. and we'll take 500, a thousand, you know, Lyft, Uber rides and, and talk about buckle and mm -hmm. pass out information because, you know, they tell you all about the city. Yeah. They tell you about the, what they go through and their trials yeah. and tribulations. And I think if you were to look at even the marketing stuff, everything we do is out of the eyes of a driver and yeah. it's, we, we embrace them and we champion the driver. So it's, it's a great strategy to understand this segment of our society. That's critical and yeah. that supports us. Yeah, no, I appreciate you sharing that antidote anecdote, because I feel like a lot of people reach out to me for, you know, a number of reasons, you know, whether it's like academic or media, you know, looking to survey drivers or, you know, on the more product service side, you know, looking to market and, you know, offer products to drivers or even do research into product design. And I feel like, uh, you know, for a lot of the reasons you mentioned, even just launching with a bunch of brand ambassadors, you know, I think these are really effective ways. So just from a marketing perspective, I appreciate you sharing that tidbit because I think it could be really valuable. And also just frankly, no one's really doing it. So that often makes it, you know, more effective. Effective. Um, so I, I think that it's a good growth strategy. Um, so we could probably talk about marketing for a while, but I would love to give me the 30 second uh, elevator pitch on Buckle. You've sort of uh, mentioned a little bit here and there, but you know, pitch me. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really simple. We're, we're providing financial services to people that operate, support, and live within the gig economy. Mm -hmm. We provide financial services, you know, that to the gig economy, which we define as people are using multiple, multiple income sources to support themselves. So, mm -hmm. you know, when you get outside of Manhattan or you get outside of San Francisco and maybe LA, the vast majority of all rideshare drivers are part-time and mm -hmm. they work at all these various jobs and they might do a couple drives on the weekend, a couple rides on the way home. So what we're really trying to do is help these people that are doing multiple gigs, using multiple paychecks to support mm -hmm. their lives, their families, put themselves through college to buy financial service products. Mm -hmm. We totally ignore credit. We think credit's discriminatory in our underwriting decisions. And we try to support the people that we say are caught in what we call the, the, the credit score trap, right? Mm -hmm. If you're not a prime or uh, a prime risk or a, you know, yeah. a, um, a standard risk, you pay 50 to 100% more for your insurance. Mm -hmm. You pay you know, two, 300% more for your leasing or your car loans. So our goal is to segment these drivers, help these drivers buy affordable financial products, starting with insurance and then leasing to follow on after that. Got it. Yeah. And so you've mentioned a couple of times financial services, you know, I guess I have thought of up until now a buckle as an insurance company, and it sounds like that's maybe your main product, but I mean, tell me more what, what are the financial services that you feel, you know, folks in the gig economy kind of need or are coming to you or that you're looking at offering? Yeah, the, the, obviously we started with insurance. Mm -hmm. It's a huge need that everybody has. But the second piece is credit in the form of leasing. And mm -hmm. when you look at these drivers who typically have a lower credit score, they are paying 25, 30% interest on, for their vehicles. They're buying them on B lots. 
They're yep. spending $15,000 for a vehicle that really only costs $11,000. So what mm -hmm. we're working with our partners uh, and these drivers is how do we help them get a affordable car at a price that's fair at a reasonable re interest rate so that they can actually put more money in their pocket on an everyday basis. So th the first is insurance. The second is leasing for credit. And then we'll go from there. So when we say financial services, it's usually yeah. for these, this segment, the two, the most important asset they have is their vehicle. Yeah. You know, credit in the form of leasing is actually a really interesting concept. And I think it's something that has been really underserved in the past. I think you've actually mentioned this to me before, but it kind of only just clicked right now. And that I know that there are a lot of drivers out there that have, frankly have like low to no credit, I think you might call it. Um, yeah. a lot, especially a lot of folks that go to the Uber and Lyft vehicle rental services, you know, when they go to rent a car by the week, for example, or even go to Lyft directly and get a Lyft Express drive. The, the one feedback, you know, I hear from all of these companies that there's huge demand for these services. You know, they place a Craigslist ad and they get a ton of people don't have a car, don't have a job. You know, they want to work for these services. They want to rent a car and then sign up to drive for Uber and Lyft, but they all have low to no um, credit. So it seems like an opportunity to, you know, even though they might be coming, you know, to those services to, to work and make, a, make money, but it seems like there's an opportunity to actually help their credit score along the way. I'm, I'm curious, how do you think about that? Is that like something that you market to these drivers? Is that like an added byproduct? Or how do you think about like, actually, it almost seems like they don't know they need it until they start, you know, getting it, right? Well, the first thing is we look at all of our uh, customers as members mm -hmm. and how do we support these members? And what we are starting to find and what we have found in the past is that they outperform their subprime or their, their lower mm -hmm. credit score. So by using different sets of data, we're able to actually segment them out and help them get a vehicle from a reputable dealer at, at a reasonable interest rate and, mm -hmm. and build equity into that asset that's theirs, right? Versus the alternative of, of what they're doing. And, and for us, it starts with insurance, working with them, understanding how you know, th they use their vehicles and then, mm -hmm. and, and then migrating into leasing. Because again, I mean, it's th the entire ecosystem needs vehicles as well. Yeah. Um, and I, I want to get into some of the details of that, but I think it might be helpful at a high level. Can you share a little bit about where you're operating? And, you know, if you want to share numbers about how many drivers or products, I mean, it sounds like mainly what you guys are looking um, for insur or offering insurance to your members right now. Can you give us a high level of where the company's uh, at? Very specifically today, we're in Georgia, Tennessee, and Illinois. By the okay. end of Q2, we'll reach a little more than 30% of the U.S. population as we roll into additional states like the D.C. metro area, which is a tri-state market, mm -hmm. Texas, and some other states. So there's rapid expansion coming uh, in you know, the next 90, 100 days um, and rolling into really big states where there's lots of people and demand. Got it. Yeah, no, that, that's helpful. So not available everywhere, but in close to 30% of the country very soon. And I yes. think if you got, you guys have been raising some money, so I assume that, you know, you're on the, the war path to quickly expanding more and more places. It sounds yeah, like. Yeah, I always caveat this. The challenge with insurance <laughs> is it's regulated at the state level. So it is yep. a state by state by state process. <laughs> so it's not like just one day we want to say, Hey, we want to be in California or let's go to Texas. We have to go yeah. through an entire regulatory process the state governments vest us, vet us mm. to make sure that we're financially stable, that we're good for the state, we're good for the, their you know, constituents in the state. So it is a process. And as me, who wants to go as fast as possible, there mm -hmm. is a, uh, uh, a slower roll up than I would obviously want. Um, Least yeah. we can move a little faster because it's a different regulatory framework, but uh, it is the challenges of living in a, uh, a regula regulated uh, industry. Yeah, well, I think you're going to have to get used to that if you're going to, you know, head up an insurance company. I think you're probably already well aware of that. And I have, I will say, you know, I remember one time I was meeting with some folks at Uber in San Francisco in their corporate office about one of the topics we discussed was insurance. I remember sitting on the table, it was probably a, a stack, like a packet of 150 pages of paper, maybe more. And they told me there was some sort of insurance filing for the state. And ever since that, you know, image kind of stuck with my head, I'm like, oh my God, every time a company wants to launch, you know, a new product, insurance product in every single state, you know, it's like they have to do some 150 page filing. I don't know. There's probably more to it than that even, but I just remember seeing that physical 150 pages on a table. <laughs> we, we invest heavily in our, in our regulatory and compliance team, because it is a lot of work. It's a lot of detail, yeah. but uh, it's, it's going to be worth it in the end. How big is the company right now? Uh, you know, we're just under a hundred people. Okay, cool. So um, yeah, growing because... fast. 
Yeah, it, it is interesting. I mean, you guys started off in Georgia, you know, one thing, um, I mean, I, I'm curious to know why you started there. I assume it has something to do with you being based there, but also, you know, I will say, you know, most companies that are launching products or services for drivers uh, tend to go for the big markets first, you know, the LA, the San Francisco, the Chicago, you said something er earlier that was interesting to me about kind of going after those middle of the road. I don't know how you described it, you know, but the kind of gig workers in the middle, you know, maybe not the full-timers, you know, more of the part-time. Uh, can you talk a little bit about why? Why, you know, sort of your, your launch strategy, I guess you would say, and kind of how and why you picked Georgia and where you're going from here? Well, I'm born and raised in Atlanta. So okay. being from there, <laughs> there was a, a natural starting point. And Got it. Uh, it isn't that small of a city, even though it's not in New York or Houston or Chicago. But That's true. There. Biggest airport it's, in it, the world, I want to say. <laughs> it, it is. So there's, there is a, a very good uh, ride share market here. So that, yeah. that really helps. But again, I think you touched on it a second ago is we're really focused on the part-time driver mm -hmm. um, because they have a whole different set of requirements than someone that's driving their vehicle 80 hours a week. Mm -hmm. Depreciation plays into it differently. Risk yeah. is different because most people would agree the longer a vehicle's on the road, the higher likelihood it would be to get into an accident. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we play more so into the part-time driver, which is you know, 90, 92% of all drivers in North America. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because when you live in Dallas, Texas, or Kansas City, right. you know, those those tend to be part time markets. Um, so that's that's definitely a big piece of our strategy. Don't don't get me wrong; we will be mm -hmm. in supporting drivers in our taxi limo program in yeah. in our black pro in you know, Manhattan and San Francisco and the big cities. But uh, that was the initial start. Yeah. Well, I think it is interesting to think about this part-time versus full-time, you know, sort of really difference, right? Because as you mentioned, some of the actual, you know, vehicle needs, right? The way you think about depreciation and the marginal expenses are different for a full-time driver versus a part-time driver. And I feel like a lot of companies, you know, I'm thinking, for example, like in the rideshare advertising space, they tend to want drivers who are more in the big cities who are really like more the full-time drivers because they're going to be on the road more often, you know, running around with billboards in the places, you know, where the target demographics are, um, you know, seeing their ads, for example, right? But I think you're also in a position where the majority of drivers, um, you know, are part-time, as you okay. mentioned, they may not, I, you know, actually, we've kind of studied this, and they don't make up, you know, that small number of full-time drivers make up a majority of the total hours and total trips on the platform. But it sounds like you maybe potentially don't care about that as much. Um, it sounds like, you know, the more members that you can sign up, you know, because those are those part-time drivers, is actually that kind of strategy right now. Is that how you're thinking about it yeah and these are you know teachers that might drive in the summer mm -hmm. they're uh, they're people that work you know at a cvs or in a call center that are doing extra hustles on the yeah. side to, to to pay for things and get ahead in life and you know that's that's our core focus um the, those full-time drivers they just have a whole different sets of needs uh mm -hmm. whether it's on their vehicle whether it's on their insurance and we, we're definitely aware of them and we're definitely try to we try to serve them we do have a tax you know a black car full-time product but our core mm. focus to start is on this part-time driver and, yeah. and that's the vast majority of those drivers in the markets that we we really operate in Got it. I think the only other thing that might be helpful, the only other definition I'm going to ask you for is okay. for those who may not be aware, can you explain what rideshare insurance is and sort of why it's so important for gig workers and all these members that you're signing up? Yeah. So what Buckle does and what rideshare insurance in our world is, is a commercial mm -hmm. auto policy that mm -hmm. allows for heavy personal use. So when you buy a Buckle commercial auto or a Buckle hybrid policy, which we call it, it covers mm -hmm. you on whether you're driving for rideshare, whether you're driving, doing food delivery, whether mm -hmm. you're running an errand on a road trip for vacation, you know, taking your kids to baseball yeah. practice. So it provides complete coverage for the entire use of the vehicle. So the driver mm -hmm. doesn't have to worry, am I covered, am I not? Yeah. Is there a $2,500 deductible? Is it a $500 deductible? Yeah. It is very easy to understand. It's very affordable. Um, and, I, and, and in fact, Lyft actually pays their drivers more if they have a buckle policy. Hmm. Interesting, how does that partnership work? It, it's great, you know, we, we work closely with them to you know market to their drivers because mm -hmm. their drivers see a huge benefit and you know and if it's good for lyft and it's good for their drivers it's good for the entire ecosystem
So I'm a Lyft driver in Georgia, for example, and mm -hmm. I sign up to drive with Lyft. I've got, let's say, Geico insurance, and I get an email from Lyft talking about Buckle. What's the call to action? It's to sign up with a Buckle policy that would replace my Geico policy, and now I save every mile that I drive with Lyft. Is that kind of the gist of it? Absolutely. So again, the Buckle policy, and this is important, mm -hmm. replaces any policy that the driver has is a single yeah. policy. There's no rant, there's no ride share endorsement that has some coverage or not. And then we work with our distribution partners, which are the ride share companies and the food delivery mm -hmm. companies to, to, to market our product because it's good for them. It's good for the drivers. And in some instances that you can earn more per trip mm -hmm. if you have our policy versus the alternative. So it's, it's just really good for the, the transportation companies and it's really good for the drivers and it's good for the ecosystem. Yeah. Well, because I know it's very, you know, insurance is a big cost for all of these companies. I think Uber just increased their deductible. It was 500 or it was a thousand dollars for a while and Lyft was 2,500. And now, um, you know, Uber has matched them at 2,500, which, you know, frankly, like I talked to a lot of, like most people have a much lower deductible on their personal insurance. Right. So they're pretty surprised if they get hit. Yeah. yeah. Usually 500, as you know, um, you know, $500, I think is a lot more common. So 2,500 is a lot. Um, so, I mean, I think as far as, you know, when it comes to partnering with the companies, wh wh what's the value you've sort of seen with them, like, you know, in offering this type of coverage? Well, I think, I think what you just said there is really interesting. I want to step back a second. So our policies have a $500 deductible. $2,500, okay. by the way, when you get into an accident is a lot of money. It's I, a lot of money. Dustin, for anybody. I was being nice. It's like crazy expensive to be perfectly right. blunt, you know? <laughs> and, 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 and not only that, when they get into an accident, they're losing their vehicle, which they help right. use to pay for that accident. Right. You know, for that said deductible. <laughs> exactly. So so our policies have a $500 deductible. Our drivers, our members absolutely love it. They mm -hmm. understand it. It makes sense. So I, I think that is, that is an absolute critical piece to what we do, right? It's th these drivers, they, they need help. Mm -hmm. And yes, insurance is expensive to the, the rideshare companies. It's expensive to the food delivery companies. There's duplicative coverage. There's confusing coverage. Who's yeah. here? Who's there? We just take it all off the table and make mm -hmm. it really simple. Just use a buckle policy. You're covered. <laughs> Everybody's happy. The drivers love it. The transportation companies love it. The regulators love it. The general public loves it because we're getting these cars fixed, reasonably priced, and yeah. getting them back on the road. So how does the cost compare for a buckle policy to, you know, others? And I mean, I know it's, it might be a little tough, you know, on this podcast right now, because I know insurance costs can vary so wi wildly, but do you guys have data around, you know, what it, what it is compared? I mean, is it, you know, the same you found or are people switching? Is it more expensive? What, what, what am I uh, looking at here if I'm a consumer? Well, we're very aware that price is one of the key driving factors to making insurance decisions mm -hmm. along with coverage. So the first thing is we have comparable coverage to what our customer base wants, which is very similar to a personal auto, but you can use it to yep. do other things. Then what we do, we do a lot of research and studying and looking at how you know this driver base be behaves, how they use their car. Because when you use your car to generate mm -hmm. revenue, you, you treat it differently than when you don't, because it's so yeah. important. And we use different data sets so that we can price very competitively and in, 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 you know, better than subprime or non-standard mm -hmm. rates. So we get really aggressive in pricing um, because, because of that. And then we work with you know, Uber, Lyft, DoorDash, all those type of people to help distribute our products, mm -hmm. all, you know, to, to help you know, market it because it's very difficult to reach this segment of the population. Yeah. And, and we lean on our partners to, to talk about us. Yeah. I mean, I'm kind of thinking and correct me if I'm wrong, that Uber and Lyft drivers and other gig workers are sort of, you know, have traditionally been kind of, you know, more risky in the sense that, you know, I'm incentivized, you know, if I think about my personal incentive as an Uber or Lyft driver, I'm kind of incentivized to drive as fast as possible, you know, within reason, you know, in between trips to get to my passengers, because the more trips I can do per hour, the more money I make, I'm kind of also incentivized to maybe drive Friday, not every driver, but a lot of drivers Friday, Saturday nights, when I'm pretty sure there are more accidents, um, um, you know, and even nighttime more generally. So is this sort of about, uh, do you guys kind of try to align the incentives between the driver and say, Hey, you know, if you're driving at times and places where it's less expensive for us to insure you, we're going to give you a discount or how do you, how does that actual connection uh, happen? Yeah. I mean, we're working on becoming more and more sophisticated in helping our mm -hmm. drivers understand those things to further lower their cost of insurance. But 
but we do look at various data sets to help figure out you know where you know what is more risky versus what is not but a couple mm-hmm. things do happen right you don't accept getting into a back of a Lyft or an Uber with a, a broken you know, taillight or a windshield yep. that's got a huge crack on it. And at the, at the same time, when you're in the back of these vehicles, you know, running stop signs and speeding is yeah. just not acceptable. So looking at things like star ranking and other mm-hmm. data sets is where we get really, really competitive. But again, mm-hmm. The world looks at these people as high risk because they have yeah. you know, not high credit scores. And if we, by throwing out the credit score and looking at other things, we're able to get yeah. competitive in that world because they outperform that. And they're just caught yeah. in this trap that they can't get out of because they're just paying too much for everything yeah. and all their services all the time. So yeah. a combination of those sort of things allows us to, to really get to where we need to be. Yeah. And I mean, I guess it seems like kind of what you're explaining is that there's a certain arbitrage if, you know, most insurance companies, for example, are looking at a credit score as a determination of potential risk. You know, there maybe is some correlation, but there's probably a lot of drivers out there basically who have low to no credit um, that aren't, you know, nearly as risky as like a traditional insurance company might deem their profile. So if you can identify those drivers, then you can offer them coverage at a lower cost and sort of everyone wins. Is that kind of the gist of it? I mean, that is it. The financial service industry Mm -hmm is designed between good credit and poor credit, and there is no in between. And there's a huge segment of the population that are in between. So that's what we're really good at is helping those people. And if we can help them break free of this trap, think about it. If you serve, you know, if you save a hundred bucks a a month on whether it's insurance and another hundred dollars or $200 on your lease a year, I mean, that becomes a real number. And that real number allows you to break free of this, you know, subprime, trap that these people get caught in and, and move in to earning more income and building equity and building wealth. And if we can help those drivers and help these people, the world's just a better place. And, and that's really what Buckle yeah. is, is based on. And, and we see it from you know, our members, we see it in the Facebook groups, we hear it on you know, our MPS scores. Yeah. They, just, they love it because it's real and yeah. they're working hard. Yeah. You mentioned the ratings. I think that's a good example, actually. You know, if you've got a driver who's a 4.95 star rated driver, and you know, that probably means that they're doing a pretty good job when they have a passenger in the car, they're not driving too crazy. Right. And obviously, you know, you don't know exactly what they're doing or not doing as far as safe driving, but what other type, I mean, can you share another example or two of, you know, like an actual uh, data set or, you know, I guess indicator that you can look at that kind of allows you to say, Hey, this means that they're a good driver, I guess, in your underwriting. Right. And that we could potentially make their I mean, insurance more competitive. Don't forget, I, I, I know you've been in a lot of uh, Ubers and Lyfts. Remember, always remember five for five. That was always yeah. a big get out of the car <laughs> saying, right? Because these drivers do care about their star ranking. And, and quite frankly, as passengers, we should as well. I mean, we definitely do look at some traditional you know, data sets as well. Time mm-hmm. on app, you know, how long are you driving? Because as I had mentioned before, the longer you drive, there's no doubt about it, the higher mm. risk there is. So there are some things like that. We're starting to look at time and when you drive as, as well. You know, and mm-hmm. you know, other cities are safer than others just because of volume and things of like that. So we, we look at traditional data and lots of non-traditional data out there. Eventually, we'll have a lot of telematics built in as well, um, looking at that, that sort of thing. Yeah. Well, and I think that, you know, there's sort of these existing unique data sets that you can look into, but I think for me, I feel like there's a lot of opportunity in the future data sets to kind of like what I call aligning the incentives between the drivers and the insurance. Um, what, what do you guys consider yourself? Are you a, uh, insurance company? So we are a full stack insurance company. Yes. So we full have, stack insurance our, company. Uh, uh, I think today we're licensed in 48 States, 47 States. Okay. I might be off here a little there, but full stack carrier, um, that does end to end. So got it. So I, I really think that there's opportunity you know, to sort of align the incentives between the driver and the insurance company or carrier, right? In the sense that, you know, hey, if I'm a driver and there's certain times or places that I'm driving that are more profitable or less profitable, you know, and kind of balancing that with the potential insurance costs, for example, right? because I think a, a lot of people don't realize just how expensive the insurance can be. So that's definitely one thing, you know, I'm kind of uh, excited, you know, and kind of building in the telematics piece, right? I remember I test drove 
drove a Ford Fusion hybrid once for a, a cool campaign we did with Ford. And they had this really cool braking score, right? Because they use regenerative brakes in the hybrids. And so every time you came to a stop, it would give you a little score from zero to 100. Right. You know, And if you got to 100, that was a perfect, slow, smooth stop, which is great for safe driving, but it also is good for regenerating the brakes, which then helps your miles per gallon, right? And so it almost sort of gamifies that aspect, but there's some you know, mutual benefit, right? If you're always smooth braking, that's probably a lot safer you know, from an insurance underwriting perspective. So I feel like there's a lot of that cool stuff that's out there. I don't know if it's quite translating into actual insurance products, but I do feel like uh, Uber and Lyft drivers are you know, a good candidate for some of this stuff. I think you're going to see the, the entire insurance industry shift away from credit and find other data sources mm -hmm. because I, I think the world wants that. Regulators yeah. want that. And, um, you know, we champion that because yeah. credit's because it's just discriminatory. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it is what it is. All right, Dustin, bonus question. Uh, tell me about the leasing program because this is something that I think is really interesting. And I think we're seeing you know, more and more drivers uh, you know, lease or rent their cars um, on a weekly basis. Tell me about your leasing program at Buckle. As, as we advocate for our drivers, just like insurance, we realize that the car is these people's most important asset. Mm -hmm. So how do we get them better, safer vehicles that everybody likes, right? I, as a passenger, I want to be in a newer, safer vehicle that has better brakes, better tech at the same time. Yeah. The drivers want better, safer vehicles that have better mileage. Maybe they have bigger vehicles where they can make more money. And then Uber, Lyft, and all these people want safer vehicles. So what we're able to do is using, you know, going to our members and yeah. working with them to be able to, I, I think I said a few minutes ago, buy a car that A, they can afford, that mm -hmm. they're paying a fair market value at a reputable dealer, at mm -hmm. a reputable interest rate. So they're not getting taken advantage of because they have mm -hmm. a low credit score. And what we're doing is we're getting these people, all these vehicles, newer, safer vehicles that they build equity in that mm -hmm. then allows them to earn more money and the whole nine yards, right? The, the difference between buying a car at a 12% interest rate yeah. or 15% interest rate versus a 30%, which is very common to these drivers. I mean, it, it's just a ripoff. And and we're fixing that problem along with it. So again, cheaper insurance, affordable yeah. vehicles, safer vehicles, better vehicles. And, and it's like little things. If you can upgrade a four-door sedan into a minivan, all yeah. of a sudden you can just go from, you know, standard, you know, Uber and Lyft into the XL Do program and XL, earn more yeah. money. And it's just, it's just the whole thing works better. So, so are you looking for brand new folks to the platform and, you know, kind of getting them in, in the leasing program, or is it typically, you know, people come to you, they already have a car, they get insurance from you. And then now they've got the chance to sort of either upgrade, you know, either a better car, um, you know, or a bigger car, whatever it might be through your leasing program. Today, we, we start with our members. And if you're a member of Buckle, we'll work with you. Um, mm. You know, next year, I don't know how that will change, but today it's, it's something what we're trying to provide for our members. Very cool. Well, good to know. Appreciate it. All right. Awesome. Yeah. Very cool. Well, really appreciate you coming on, Dustin. Um, before I let you go, what, what's the future hold for Buckle? You talked about some expansion. You talked about some cool, uh, you know, updates to the product. What, what should we look forward to? Uh, first, first of all, you know, rapid expansion. I think I mentioned, you know, yeah. over the next, you know, 90, 100 days, uh, moving into a, a bunch of more states. I think you'll hear some more strategic partnerships launched. Um, in the coming, you know, months, mm -hmm. which are very exciting, uh, a big growth into food package delivery, uh, because they're a very similar driver. Yeah. Um, you know, they're very part-time drivers as well, because people only more, more part-time in, in that space. It's a little harder to be a full-time driver in delivery. Th space, that's right? right. That's right. Um, funny enough, there are a lot of introverts in the food delivery space versus <laughs> extroverts in the ride share space. So it's a different, it's a different customer base. Yeah. Um, and then the expansion of our, our leasing program, um, mm. at the end of the year here, as we really take, you know, that really takes off, but, um, just, just a lot of excitement at the company because, you know, uh, you know, Uber, I think yesterday or today had one of their largest, you know, March was the yeah. largest month they announced and thank God COVID's you know, coming to an end. And I think there's going to be some amazing Light celebration. At the end of the tunnel. People, <laughs> it's there and there's people moving around and that means Uber and Lyft are doing well. But at the same time, our habits have changed. We've learned that we like our food delivered. We like our packages, yeah. our, you know, our, our drug stores are delivering to us. And this, this segment of the population is just expanding so fast and it's here to stay and it's not going around. And it's how do we continue to serve these drivers, advocate for these people and really help them 
who support the world that we live in. And that's really the, the, the focus for the next, you know, call it the rest of the year and, and beyond. Very cool. And so if folks want to learn more about Buckle, um, what's the best place to follow uh, Buckle, find you guys, and I guess get a quote if you're in one of the states? We're in all the traditional social media sites, you know, Facebook, Twitter, but you can find us at buckleup.com and, and get a quote and, uh, you know, purchase a policy and uh, we'd love to have you join us. Very cool. Um, well, Dustin, really appreciate you uh, coming on and sharing uh, what's going on with Buckle and everything you guys are working on in the future to help uh, gig workers. I'm always a fan of featuring companies that are helping gig workers and you guys are doing just that. We're trying and I hope to see you in person sometime this year as well. Sounds good. Thank you for your time.